Hello, welcome to today's webinar with our with our partners from Johnson & Johnson. We're excited to begin. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Should you have any questions or technical issues, please type a question in the question box and someone from our team will be here to help you. I'd now like to introduce CorpU CEO, Alan Todd. Alan? All right, thank you, Jessica. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Alan Todd, the CEO of CorpU, and I'm thrilled to be here today. I'm with Liz Faulkner. She leads the Supply Chain Academy at J&J. &J. Say hi, Liz. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining. Yep, thank you, uh, Liz. So uh, Liz and I had the opportunity to to present at a supply chain conference a couple weeks ago uh, in San Diego, and so we're excited to share some of the updates on the great story at J&J &J and the great work that Liz and her team are doing. And so we're going to share that with you today. I'm excited, and I thought just to open, I might uh, just quickly brief you for those of you uh, that know who we are. For those of you who don't, uh, CorpU is about helping organizations. We exist to help people drive the people side of business transformation. And we do that for three reasons. There are a lot, organizations are struggling. We know that despite huge investments in leadership development, organizations, uh, CEO studies, anyone you look at, you'll still see that lack of leadership bench to execute the business in the future is still one of the top three problems that keeps CEOs up at night. Strategy execution, we know that about 70% of strategic initiatives fall short. Uh, McKinsey did an update on this piece of research earlier this year and said, look, that number hasn't changed in 30 years. And so we think it's time to bend the odds that if you're going to drive strategy and build capability, those things have to come together. And we know that in today's flatter organizations, you're going to have to develop a culture where people work together and collaborate. And so let's take a look at some of these things and set up a framework for how to think about this before I turn it over to Liz to tell her story. So one of the things we know about work being more complex is that employees have to work with 10 people who don't report to them to get their job done. That's kind of the new normal, and there's a lot of research that leads us uh, to this number. But here's the problem. When you look at that, I lost my mouse. When you look at that, a different study, The Secrets to Strategy Execution from Harvard Business Review found that about seven out of 10 people can't name their strategy. They can't name their company's strategy. And so if you're collaborating, you have to work with 10 people and seven out of 10 can't name the strategy. Obviously that puts a lot of challenge into the organization. And when we look at organizations, how their leaders feel about their ability to execute strategy, you can see that it's a small minority, about 34% feel good about it and a super majority um, that, that feel good about formulating strategy but not executing it. So why is it that organizations, that the leaders can help to develop strategy and they feel good about that capability, but when it comes time to implementing it across businesses and building the capabilities and getting people up to speed to help them learn the strategy and apply it, it tends to fall apart. So we want to study that and we want to solve that problem. So let's take a look at some of the other options. And if you look at this at this study, this is kind of an interesting set of numbers here, but just with respect to strategies, why they don't get through, um, the number one reason is that it's not well understood across the organization. So we know as people implement strategies, they almost always measure the inputs, like number of town hall meetings, number of emails, number of people that attended or got briefings or got PowerPoint slides. But those are inputs, not outputs. Outputs would tell us how many people understand the strategy, how many people have connected that to specific business measures that matter to the business, and do we have the capabilities that are required to implement this strategy. And so you can see in these numbers, in a supermajority of cases, that organizations don't have, it's not well understood, it's not translated into business measures, and they don't have the capabilities they need to win. So you got to put all that together. If you get all those things put together, the prize for closing the strategy execution gap is 60 to 100% for most companies. This is a pretty uh, large study. And the studies that I'm quoting are all sort of large studies, large um, multi-year, been going on for a lot of time from a lot of different uh, organizations that are tracking strategy. So again, we can see that people are, are, are doing well at developing it, but they're not doing so well at implementing. So we've been studying that at Corpio to look at what are the big barriers, and these are the six barriers that we've 
analyze. We've done meta-analysis across all of the leadership development literature, the collaboration literature, and strategy literature to say what keeps these things from working. So if you start at the left, leadership has a plan. They want to roll it out. And on the far right, they're executing the strategy and it's working. Everybody's aligned and executing. And so we look at those barriers. And first one is, is barrier one is understanding, like, why are we doing this? And where are we going? And what other options did we consider? And then buy-in. Should we do it? Is this the best use of our time? If you don't get these things right, intentionality, once we get those first two barriers covered off, which we rarely see those covered off in the work that we do, um, we get to the third barrier. What levers do I pull? And normally, if I get past that, I get to the fourth barrier, which is, if I'm past all that, do we have the capabilities we need to pull this off? And then finally, moving on to empowerment and motivation. So what freedom do I have to go do this thing and go move this forward on behalf of the organization? As you look at large global organizations that have lots of business units in lots of geographic regions with lots of functional leaders, somebody like J&J and Liz's organization, they've got to figure out how do I get people bought in? How do I get them motivated and excited to take part of the strategy and run with it? So we've given a definition of strategy activation, but it's a system that promotes collective enterprise engagement with strategic initiatives. And it's about two really important things, structured dialogue and the analysis of that structured dialogue. And structured dialogue for us, it's not exactly the same thing as e-learning. It's not exactly the same thing as using collaboration tools like Yammer and Chatter and Slack and Jive. Those things are good for serving different purposes. Um, but what we have found is by building a purpose-built system that's built for large-scale change management, that you can actually build the capabilities. And rather than connect people to content and hope that they get it with a strategy, which is kind of the standard approach, perhaps it's a WebEx and a set of cascading town halls, what we found is that if you can connect people in structured dialogue, so connect people together, to solve complex problems, generate and spread ideas, to teach and learn from each other and experts, and to capture and share that knowledge. If you can connect them to each other to do those things, and then use the content as a way in which they have a conversation about real work, that you can actually achieve really deep learning and deep understanding about the strategy, and they'll get it. And then the analytics, if you get it done right, and you have a lot of conversations, hundreds or thousands of conversations, you need big data analytics to measure the extent to which learning occurred, the extent to which they get it, the extent to which they're bought in, the extent to which they're connecting across boundaries, the extent to which they are solving problems and making public commitments to execute. And so these are wonderful measures that you can use big data techniques instead of surveying people, instead of pre and post course testing, use analytics and big data techniques to measure those things with a much more uh, higher fidelity and much higher degree of accuracy. And so to affect that shift, what the, the main thing that we have to do is we have to help people move from monologue to dialogue. And monologue are very good. Town hall meetings, emails, we can still do those things. But most importantly is if we can complement them with structured dialogue and make sure that when we teach them something new, here's the new strategy that we're asking people to make sense of it and tell me, what do you think? And does it, does, what does it mean to you in your part of the business? And what, do you, what parts of the strategy resonate with you? Which parts, not so much. And then once that dialogue occurs, we can use analytics to tell us a bunch of things about it. I'll give you an example of what that looks like. Um, and the way we get people to engage in dialogue, so we have two different kinds of sprints. So it, for us, it's all about the sprint. And the sprint is about connecting people together for no more than 30 minutes a day, ideally Monday through Friday. So you know, five, five days, this might be two and a half hours maximum, sometimes 20 minutes a day for four days, but some amount of structured dialogue. So we're not overdoing it. We keep it minimal so that we know that people are engaging. We're mode shifting, read something, watch something, reflect on something, join a discussion. If we follow that, we can get a unique dialogue pattern going for each day to get people to give feedback and thoughts on each of their parts of the business. And it's remarkable. You'll find when you connect people, and teach them something and say, what do you think? And how do you make sense of this? And what, how would this work in your part of the business? It's actually fun to watch as people engagement goes through the roof and people get excited that somebody's actually asking their opinion and that they, many times we hear like, nobody ever asked me that before. But it all works by getting them together in this strategy sprint to drive this structured dialogue. And there are different, all kinds of techniques to make the dialogue interesting, solve problems, generate spread ideas, again, idea tournaments, 
um, and then get it, giving them feedback on what happened. So the goal of the strategy sprint is that they're fun, fast, immensely valuable, and scalable. So you can roll these out. They're really quick. You don't do them all the time. You might only do one sprint a year. You might do two. It might be a four-day sprint, which is only two hours of deep thinking. So it's the equivalent of going to two town hall meetings. Um, and six months later, you might do a, a one-day pulse check sprint, so a follow-up. And that's what we tend to see a lot of customers do in this type of environment. And you can match the strategy sprint with a learning sprint. A learning sprint follows the same uh, process, except the difference is with the learning sprint, there's expert-led content. So like a lot of um, work that Liz has done with J&J, &J, Supply Chain Academy might have programs that come from Smeal College at Penn State on supply chain, but it could just as easily be programs like the Wharton Program on Leading Breakthrough Change or Harvard Program on Negotiation or Michigan Schools Practicing Positive Leadership and Leading Talent Programs. These programs are all built into the Learning Sprint Strategy Sprint platform, um, and you put people in the Learning Sprint. So whereas the Strategy Sprint is to drive strategy, the Learning Sprint is to build capability. And it's connecting those two things together that is the real magic of driving strategy and building capability as a virtuous cycle that sits at the center of that virtuous cycle is structured dialogue, getting people to think, bringing some humanity back to the workplace where they're actually talking to each other and doing it in a structured way. And if we do that and we connect them together and we get all that, we can look at the analytics and say, what did we learn? And so we get some early warnings. If people are having conversations and it's going the, the right way or the wrong way, we can see some things. We can see who's asking good questions and providing good answers, and we identify those people. We call those the change champions. So crucial to success in change management and large-scale change is that you have a volunteer army um, of change champions who can help you go drive that thing deep into the organization. So you need those folks on board. We identify those. And then when we run idea tournaments, we can rank things and see what kind of payback we get um, on ideas, so what's the potential payoff from low to high and feasibility low to high. And so Liz will talk about some of these things that she's doing uh, at J&J. &J. And I'm just going to wrap with just the idea that when you run an idea tournament, you might be surprised at how many ideas you get and what the value of the potential payoff is and how cool it is you'll find when you get to look at reports that go back to the strategy owner that say, here's a set of ideas that have been pressure tested by the crowd. These have been run by your directors or your VPs or plant managers or folks from around the world. And we rank, so here in the top right quadrant are the highest payback ideas that are the easiest ones to implement. And it's not one person's ideas, but we maybe crowdsourced this and pressure tested against 50 people or 500 or 5,000 people. So it's a very powerful concept. And I'll just leave you with the thought, because I love this quote. Michael Porter, since he's kind of the godfather of strategy from Harvard Business School, says, the best CEOs I know are teachers and what they teach is strategy. And so when we think about driving a strategy and activating it, it falls on the new world, the new talent development leader, the learning leader, people that are driving the people side of the business to work with the senior leaders and activate this strategy. And I can't think of a better example than to turn it over to Liz to tell us exactly what she's doing with J&J &J strategy activation and how she did it. So Liz, I'm going to pass it to you. Thanks very much, Alan. Uh, good afternoon again, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk today a little bit about what j, &J Supply Chain has been doing in uh, strategy activation as well as learning sprints. So I'll talk a little bit about um, the Johnson & Johnson Supply Chain aspirations, um, and then I'll go into where we are with our overall program strategy, and then give you a little indication of what uh, the initial findings are from doing both learning sprints and strategy activation. And I like to, to call that the power of the crowd. And then some opportunities that we see going forward of how to continue to incorporate um, this great new technology into our uh, multitude of learning programs. I'll start by talking about the supply chain, j, &J supply chain aspirations. So we do have a vision to become the world's best supply chain. And in doing that, we want to set a new standard in healthcare. Um, we have to do that by three transformational attributes that we think will be the game changers. They will differentiate ourselves from our competition. And they fall within fast track innovation, 
um, the agility that we may or may not have currently, and really looking at end-to-end -end and thinking about that customer and that customer first, and optimizing really where we want to, our value chains to be. And we can't possibly get to those transformational attributes if we don't have some core supply chain capabilities and they come in the names of technology, our partners that we um, uh, work with very closely, clearly quality is, is number one. Um, how we work within our integrated sustainability and our people. While I talk about our people last, they are what will make us that world's best supply chain in the future. So if we take what our aspirations are, and I've lost my mouse here, and I'll talk a little bit about the journey that we have been on. When we think about J&J's uh, journey through becoming that world's best supply chain, we've actually started uh, a while now. So we've been on this journey for a little bit and we really needed to stabilize our base. To try to give you just some perspective around a little bit of the complexity. So we have about 350,000 SKUs. Uh, we have about 300, 350,000 uh, SKUs. We have about 350 distribution centers, um, 250 distinct operating companies, um, about a, 100, a little over 100 manufacturing sites. We take about 100,000 orders per day across uh, our partner base of about 3,500 suppliers. And we have over 60,000 supply chain employees. So that complexity has um, reared itself in trying to stabilize and fix that base and really projecting ourselves in the future in having that customer facing, customer centricity. And along this journey, we really believe that we will get through breakthrough performance and build that competitive advantage with those core uh, and transformational attributes. So as you can see, you know, we're, we're right um, on the cusp of that breakthrough performance. And if any of you were at Gartner, uh, the, a couple weeks ago, you'd seen that we have moved significantly up that uh, supply chain Gartner scale. We like to say that we need to do this by our um, key components. And when I talk about key components, we're going, how we're going on this journey is our aspiration. How we're going to get there is through programs that we have coined called North Stars or Foundational Pillars. And within one of those North Stars is um, a, a program or a strategy around shaping the portfolio that we believe will help us differentiate ourselves in the marketplace in conjunction with our R&D and commercial partners. And on the other side of that is foundational pillars. And these foundational pillars, and one of them uh, is product supply execution. Building those capabilities within that foundation will help to accelerate the transformation. One can't be done without the other. They're both critical elements. And those two that I called out helped us with our JJOS, the new supply chain way. We're going to do this and get there by a number of uh, strategically aligned projects, building capabilities or enhancing capabilities that we already have, and through uh, generated new skill sets that we will enable our employees with. So that brings me to talk about um, one of our first programs that we engaged in with Corpu, which was a learning sprint. And we embedded that in our plant leader development program, as well as one of our sectors in North America, our consumer sector. And we really did this to help build and strengthen the capabilities around end to end and really show the value that comes from looking not just in your functional silos, but really um, throughout the supply chain functions as a whole as well as with R&D and commercial. And we did this, um, as Alan indicated, uh, utilizing the learning sprint within Penn State SMEAL. And we had some very interesting and engaged uh, 
program participants and ones that that actually uh, quoted some of to our senior leaders and saying this was one of the best programs that they have gone through and really helped them through their action learning projects. The values that we got from that, as we called, you know, harnessing that power of the crowd, really starts as simply as that cross-functional and cross-global collaboration. Um, I like to call these, these folks here as we talk about these larger dots as the chief dot connectors, or, or as Alan said, your change agents. They're the ones that um, really understood the materials and not only themselves, but then helped and brought others along. And that network analysis that we got showed that very strongly in both the plant leader uh, development program as well as our uh, consumer North America program. If we continue to go on, Alan mentioned learning sprints. And in our learning sprint, we actually embedded an idea tournament. And in that idea tournament, it was an ability for the folks to actually talk about the ideas that they have that are aligned with our strategy. And as you can see here, there was, there was approximately 30 new unique ideas generated that had an estimated financial impact of $74 million. To do this, the use of social media and the way that the platform allows us to monitor those trends and look at the information that comes through is actually very priceless to us. When we harness that power of, oops, excuse me. When we harness that power of the organization, could someone help me? I can't seem to locate the program. I need to go back three slides. Thank you. Back to where, right? Uh, there we go. So as this we want to harness the power of this, um, the analysis that comes out of that language processing gives us an idea much better than any pre or post test you could take that really makes, them, makes us understand, did they get it? Did the participants uh, that were going through either this learning journey with us or uh, with the, the sprint, really understood the information that we were giving them and could they articulate that back? And as we, as uh, the natural language processing happens, there uncovers hidden um, challenges that we may or may not have been aware of, but it also leads us to really where to place our emphasis for that next sprint or that next time that we're engaging this population. And as you can see, there was, in our case, there were various different reasons for that, that improvement that could have been made or the difficulty that they found uh, in looking at that learning journey. So that takes us from learning journeys to strategy activation. And as I indicated, from both our North Stars and our foundational pillars, we've come up with a uh, new way of working, the new supply chain way, where we call that JJOS, uh, the Johnson & Johnson Operating System. And it will be one way we work, and one way we improve, and one way we solve problems. And in doing that, we have come up with what this integrated platform looks like, and it takes all of the components within our Johnson & Johnson production system and brings in the other functional areas of plan source deliver and quality along with our portfolio management and our value chain management. And we're hoping in the future that that will lead us to that pathway of the best supply chain in the world. However, how do we get all of those 60,000 employees on the same path and understanding the value? So when we went to look at it, we knew that JJOS creates value by differentiating the, the customer value proposition. We needed to make sure that people understood that JJOS will improve reliability. It will streamline and optimize our end-to-end -end flow. It makes us more agile and it, we will have a robust supply chain management. 
which will eventually enable business growth and enhance our profitability. That's what JJOS is. And now, how do we make sure everybody understands the value of this new operating system? And so to do that, we looked to Corpus strategy activation, but we had some very strong requirements that we needed. It had to have real world application. It couldn't be another death by PowerPoint. It had to enhance the value of our already very popular roadshows. But we needed to do that with speed and scale. Um, getting around to all of our plants, as well as our distribution centers, would have taken too much time from a roadshow perspective. We needed to make sure that there was a way that to promote the enterprise engagement. And we wanted to do that with structured dialogue so that we could have an understanding through measurable analytics that people really understood what this new strategy was all about. So we went and developed JJOS strategy activation, or we'll, we name it as JJOS exchange. And we've take, taken some structured dialogue. And as you can see, we have, um, it, it goes across a, about a seven day uh, plan. Some of that is just an introduction um, in the beginning. But then we actually go through materials that we read or videos that we watch. But we really ask folks then to take that information and reflect upon it. Interestingly, some of our initial survey questions of, do you understand JJOS? And we would get answers of that varied the spectrum. But then when we ask them to reflect about it and to actually talk or dialogue with the other participants is where we saw that they didn't quite understand it enough. And so then we had opportunities to discuss. We had um, office hours with some of the JJOS leadership so that they could really get their questions answered and that continued that dialogue. And we uncovered some obstacles that some we knew that we were going to anticipate and others um, were new to us that we have now taken those feedbacks and have um, reapplied that program and have gotten now an improved version that we are getting ready to release with the feedback from the initial participants. So in summary here, what I'd like to say is there's been opportunities to transform how we've worked. We will continue these rollouts um, to promote that end-to-end -end alignment and that end-to-end -end knowledge that will address many of our business challenges. We will continue to use strategy activation or our JJOS exchange um, so that people can understand the new methodology. And right now, we're reevaluating um, quite a few of our leadership development programs to make sure that we incorporate a digital dialogue into those programs to enhance the value that people have uh, with one another and continue that learning approach. Alan, back to you. All right, thank you, Liz. So uh, any questions that you have, please type them in the question box. Um, so we're looking for questions for Liz. And I have a number of questions coming in and my screen is filling. So, um, so Liz, can you talk a little bit about um, the end, this, this idea of end-to-end -end mindsets? Have you seen a difference in, uh, in the way people think uh, for folks that went through the program to, the, to develop end-to-end -end mindsets? Uh, yes, I, I actually can. And I'll give you an example within our plant leader development program. Uh, it's a program that we have run for quite a few years now, but we instituted the end-to-end -end program um, two classes ago. And what we had seen, and, and a little bit about the program, just so that you understand, it is a uh, learning journey that we give to newly minted or ready now uh, plant leaders when they're ready for their next um, uh, promotion. And in doing that, it's a two residency. So we bring the folks in for two one week residencies by about uh, six to eight months in between. With this, uh, with previous classes, they're also given an action learning project. 
and they need to deliver a business value from that action learning project. So it's not just learning and education, but it's we're, we're looking for um, business value to come out of those projects. And what we had uh, seen previously was that some of the business value was not necessarily at the highest level or highest caliber that it could have been. As we instituted the end-to-end -end program two classes ago, what we saw significantly was business value that got incorporated right into the business planning cycles and brought value back and in, in to, to each of the business sectors for that action learning. And in talking to the participants, they all clearly related it back to learning through that end to end and un unleashing and um, the power of them talking and communicating together, not only for their project, but how to look across their functional silos, because in this particular class was all in the make space and some of their projects needed them to look beyond that. So we really did see a financial as well as a, um, a growth in learning through that end-to-end -end program. Great. And so with, with regard to that end-to-end, -end, there's a question here. I'm just looking across. Um, did you include people from different functional teams? And if yes, did people value collaborating across functional teams as well as across geographies? So for the plant leaders, no, they were all in the make space. But the Consumer North America program did utilize um, a couple of functions within particularly project management and plan um, and quality. And, you know, it was, it was interesting to see that the, the collaboration that came out, um, some of the quotes that we got there, particularly from some of our quality associates, were saying they didn't realize the impact of some of the things that they required or they needed had on the other functions. And so it was a little... Um, uh, awareness opening for them also, but they did learn to work together. Now, fortunately or unfortunately, it was within the same sector in the same region there. We haven't yet um, done a end-to-end uh, -end program where we go across our business segments, so farm, consumer, or medical devices, and globally, although that is in our um, long-range uh, planning for that. Yeah, and I'm wondering, uh, Liz, if you could answer just extending the same sort of set of questions so far, uh, the question about the time zone differences, like how do you handle all the cross-functional and global um, with time zones? Yep, so um, I, I will say our, our Asian colleagues are always the one that takes a little bit of the brunt on this, but the beauty of this program is that you're doing it at your own pace, at your own time, and you're collaborating virtually together. Um, you're only required to come together in the end-to-end -end program once a week for a, um, a connected learning experience with Penn State faculty, as well as J&J &J, uh, uh, SMEs. And so we try to limit the amount of time, but it, it does truly affect our, our Asian colleagues more. They do give up their nights, or at least an hour of one of their nights. However, we did experiment this past class of um, having a virtual session. So instead of having a uh, connected hour between eight and nine uh, Eastern Standard Time, we actually would do a virtual with both the uh, Penn State faculty as well as the SME. So questions got answered and more connected dialogue happened. And we were just doing a, a little pilot test to see if that was would be a way to kind of overcome the time zones. Yep, cool, very good. And you mentioned something about surveys versus dialogue, and you went and implemented something called office hours, and you said that the dialogue gave you so much, something much richer than surveys. Can you talk about dialogue and off, and and then what arose that caused uh, that you went to office hours? Sure. So when we were building strategy activation for JJOS Exchange. We felt it was necessary that not only did they hear the JGOS leaders in the videos, but that they would have some time to talk with them. So we instituted an office hours 
um, again, that was just one hour. Um, and, and in that case, it was not a mandatory part of the program. You could call in if you wanted to have a question or you could call in to listen, but we would have those uh, leaders available for that one hour. What we found is that a lot of the dialogue leading up to those um, that office hours, there was a lot of spurring of questions. And that spurring of questions helped us to understand, did we hit the mark on the materials? And did we get the right materials? And then the questions in the office hours really were more about you know, making something a little bit clearer or digging a little bit deeper than we did had just scratched that surface. So that dialogue um, pre-office hours really um, enhanced the office hours that we had because we, the, the beauty of the platform and the beauty of the analytics is that you can gather that all that information and what was really bubbling to the top to allow the leaders to address those, even if those questions didn't come in. Yep, beautiful. So I have a question, I'm glad you just said analytics. What benefits or feedback loops did analytics, uh, Corpview Analytics provide that weren't as obvious or transparent during the other strategy town halls or capability building exercises? So what we really um, uncovered under some of that is, is and it's typical for, for a town hall, there may be some questions. You may get the, the brave one or two souls that ask the question, but we really, um, but sometimes those questions really are just, um, you know, uh, very trans not very transparent, and they're they're just something to you know clarify a point that you made or go back and ask a, a clarifying question on a number on the slide. What we found in the dialogue, though, was that there was some some more information about the cross functional collaboration that was really going to have something that we were really going to have to overcome. While we knew we have been in our functional silos for a while um, and we have been um, uh, espousing the, the value of end to end, really making them understand what that means, um, they have uncovered for us probably more deep functional um, silos than we had realized and ways that we will have to utilize JJOS in the, uh, to, as we start to roll that out to break down those silos and get people thinking really end to end there. So that was a little bit of an aha. We had some that weren't such an aha, right? To give you the, the flip side, right? You know, a lot of folks said that there was going to be, wow, there's probably additional resources that we're gonna to need to be able to do this or additional investments. And while that's true, there will be some investments that we will be making. What we wanted folks to understand is that in this new way of working um, in harmonizing and standardizing one way, we'll actually get much more efficiencies. And so there was a, um, a concern there that we think we'll, we will have to, you know, address in future rollouts so that they folks really understand that the power of, of standardization can bring some additional value. Yep, got it. Uh, so I'm curious, we, we have a question um, about the why of JJOS, and I'm just going to frame it this way, Liz. We know that a lot of uh, people struggle with change management and strategy execution because people don't ever understand the why. Like, why are we doing this? And you know, th and then you get into the where are we going and what are we doing and how are we going to get there. So, sort of the why, the what, and the how. Um, and and the question is, um, did the did the by run did, with with JJOS were you successful in helping people answer like why we are implementing J J O S and why it's important to the organization. I guess that's the number one reason why programs fall down or one of the top three is, is people can't answer the why. They actually don't they don't understand the purpose of it. And I'm wondering, were you able to get successful and people that are participants in JJOS strategy sprints, um, can they answer the why? So great question. And I will tell you that we are still on this journey. We are in the infancy of this journey. Um, so I don't want it to imply that, you know, we've solved it all and, and yay, we're done. Um, we're just beginning. And so um, one of the things that, that at least came out from those initial sprint is to say that um, we did get people to understand the connections with the JJOS, uh, excuse me, with the 
uh, Johnson Johnson supply chain st strategy, right? So they understood how this fit in there and they may not have understood that previously. So that in right. our sense is the win for that why. And they and it was a, a clear way for us to differentiate that customer value and that proposition. So I think we did have some aha moments, but I will say that we are still on that journey and we are just beginning. Yep. Okay. And it sounds like that's popular, helping people find out the why. I mean that's just that the one for me, I know that's one of the biggest things is people when they're doing things in large global organizations, they 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 many times the further away you get from headquarters, the worse their chances of answering the question like why are we doing this? And if the further away you get, you don't grab hold of that. I think it's a huge opportunity for for folks like us and you and uh, uh, those of us that are practitioners in learning and development and strategy execution and large scale change management. I think it's just a huge opportunity. Um, so here's a new question. Moving on. How popular is the virtual learning culture at J&J, &J, and what barriers did you face in embedding this program? Another great question. So I will tell you that um, uh, you heard me allude to it before that we have a you know, kind of death by PowerPoint, and we we did have that as our as our uh, e-platform, shall we say, learning. And so I think there was a little resistance when we first started to say, you know, yeah, this is going to be the same thing. And I'm going to listen to a slide where, you know, people read the slide to me and they're going to, they're going to call this a new, you know, a new e-learning. And I think where people were pleasantly surprised is once they started to participate, the, the, the dialogue, the interaction with one another, that social connected element. Um, really started to bring forth and people um, played off of that. So I will tell you it was a little bit of an uphill battle to um, let's say sell the idea of connected learning and bringing in a connected learning platform. But once it's gotten in here, now we're starting to get the pull. In fact, probably pull more than we can handle right now, but pull that comes in because people really are beginning to see the value and they're beginning to see the power of um, not only having that dialogue, but identifying those chief dot connectors, identifying those change agents, because they will really actually help regardless of whether it's a strategy you're trying to activate or just the, the continuous learning culture that we're trying to bring in. Yep, got it. And and in terms of those idea tournaments, just a question, have you have you made progress implementing improvements proposed through the idea tournament? So any any sort of follow on from that or any lessons learned running an idea tournament? Yeah, so I will tell you that um, the next step, uh, we haven't implemented any of these ideas that have come out. However, one of, as I talked about our, um, the way we do our leadership development programs is we have an action learning project that comes with that. And so our next round, particularly within the plant leaders, will be to take these ideas and make them the cornerstones for our action learning to see where we can take that next and, and have them bubble up. We do have law, um, a, a very, um, separate uh, innovation and innovation tournaments that we do and hackathons that we do within J&J &J, and a lot of ideas surface there. So I would love to be able to tell you that we've taken all those 30 great ideas and, and started that implementation, but it hasn't happened that way. It's more been of getting people to understand how to generate those ideas and how to think um, that end-to-end -end perspective. Yep, got it. Um, and, and so here's a question just on the dialogue. Is the dialogue conducted through conference calls, collaboration tools? Is it face-to-face -face dialogue, both, all of the above? Same question for idea tournaments. Okay, so for the dialogue, it's a little bit of all of the above, but most of it's done within the platform. So, you know, it is a social connected learning platform. And so there is that dialogue that's conducted um, as they're learning. So they'll learn something, they'll um, ideate on it, they'll blog about it, for lack of a better way to, to say that, and then people start picking up on that. And the, the particularly the first plant leader program that we did, the connections, and what I mean by that is it wasn't just a monologue, it wasn't just people out there, you know, blogging and posting about what, um, 
what they thought. It was really then other people and having that dialogue back and forth, which is really where adult learning um, starts to sink in when you can actually talk and teach it to someone else and they ask those questions back. So that a lot of the dialogue happened that way. However, um, each of um, the, the teams within the platforms that were working on their action learning projects, they will also have dialogue that occurs um, through WebExes and, and uh, just regular teleconferences that would go on. And then once a week, they still did get together as a larger team to really break down everything that they learned the week before. And then for the idea tournament, that was yep, just right. kind of a one week type of idea tournament. And then there was dialogue back and forth on, let's say, the voting of the best ideas. And when you, after you engage in dialogue and they go through the sprint, how do you reinforce the knowledge to achieve, to ultimately achieve the change in behavior? Any kind of thoughts in follow through or, or um, knowledge retention? So it's it's a great question, right? And that's what most um, educators suffer with, because as you walk out of the class, you you lose you know most of what you have learned in in any particular class. So one of the things that you know we have started to to monitor and implement is making sure that they're utilizing that for their next projects that may come up. So and continuing that connection that they've had with their their folks in that class as they continue to build on their next project that they would be given, whether that be in the Johnson & Johnson production system or whether that be in, as we continue to roll out, the operating system, that they're actually starting to apply those skills and continue to apply those skills. And so when they're applying, do you have any way to measure just, just how um, – ideation skills are developing. So are you guys tying any of these, uh, any of that follow through things to um, innovation or ideas, just maybe broader J and J outside of just supply chain? Is there Are there innovation initiatives and is what you're doing fitting within and, and tying the, somehow getting to the application of this? So I wish I could tell you absolutely positively yes, but but we're still in the early stages of this. So I'm not, and, and it's still within supply chain. So that connection um, outside of supply chain to our commercial business is not necessarily um, happening with these types of learning sprints that we're utilizing. It's mainly staying uh, within there. However, and we haven't, um, to answer your question, I guess you've got me thinking even more. Uh, we haven't figured out um, a better way of learning for that retention. There are some programs out there we use in some of our other um, areas, particularly in our quality space uh, through gamification, where we're, we're looking for um, that retention of that material. But we haven't implemented that with any of the uh, programs that we've run through Corpio. Yep. Okay. And can you talk about uh, um, any any synergy or benefits between the strategy sprints and the learning sprints? So I think the essence of the question is when you sort of, when you roll out J&J &J operating system and they've also gone through some of the leadership academy programs, um, and can you talk about the interplay between those two things, so the driving of the strategy and the building of the capabilities? Is there is there synergy there? Do those people become super knowledgeable or or, or can you run those two things separately and they're unrelated? So um, you can run them separately. It, it, it's, it's, it's an ability to do that. However, we really believe that with our JJOS Exchange and the end-to-end -end, um, program from uh, Penn State, we do believe we're going to get more synergy, um, excuse me, more value if we bring those two synergistically together. And what I mean by that is we will then um, identify a group, usually through their, um, through a value chain, right? So, so, so through a product value, value stream, and we will uh, bring those people together 
train or educate on the end to end from a theoretical perspective that we get from Penn State as well as the SMEs that we bring in from J&J. &J. But then at the end of that learning journey, we will incorporate the DTOS exchange sprint or the strategy activation sprint so that people understand, okay, now I get theoretically all what end to end means. And this is how J&J uh, &J is doing that through JJOS. So we're just starting on the JJOS rollouts. And as we roll out, that will be part of the education we do pre-rollout and then the introduction to that um, strategy activation before we actually get in to training and teaching on the processes around JJOS. Okay, and a question with blended learning, how much of what you're doing in JJOS um, and the Leadership Academy, uh, if you had to guess on percentages um, or just talk about the, the philosophy behind that which is virtual and that which is face-to-face. -face. And, and, and I'd love to hear just if you could talk a little bit about the practical realities of doing face-to-face -face in a global organization, um, the size and scale of J&J. &J. So how do, you, how do you all think about that and how are you using technology and where do you see it going in the future in terms of more face-to-face -face or more virtual or all the above, none of the above? So blended. So, uh Blended learning is, is important, right? It's never going to be one or the other, right? There, there's always a value um, depending on what, you know, what we're trying to educate on, um, as well as, you know, let, let's be honest, the starting point uh, the, of the capabilities that we have within the organization. Um, so blended learning will always be there. I think we have historically um, relied much more on face-to-face and now we're learning that that is not necessarily um, a way to be able to hit the masses. And so, and, and it's also not, you know, usually a very financial, financially available model either. So we are moving to a much more um, virtual space with um, virtual simulations. So we do know that, uh, that adults particularly learn better if we can simulate and with the technology we have uncovered um, with the end-to-end -end program that we're training on is really the value that people can do it at their own pace when they have a moment you know, to think, and we're not pulling people out of their day jobs to go to that class. Short microburst of learning um, is much more effective for adults. Yep, so obviously more towards virtual in the future and more personalized, so it make, makes good sense. Can you talk a little bit about um, the top leaders role. So in a, other than office hours, how do you get them bought in and how do you get them to help out or play along in activating the strategy or, or driving this? Um, I, I will say that at least for JJOS, um, the leaders were very involved and, and um, there was, there was more, um, um, of them wanting to. So it wasn't, I didn't have to pull a whole lot. Um, I will say we have some camera shy um, leaders. And so when I said we dragged them up to the, the studio to shoot some video of them, I'm not sure they were always so thrilled about that, but they, the comfort level came in. And I would say we got some, some really um, very engaged leaders that really understood um, the message that they were trying to get across uh, to you know, a broader audience of leaders and how their engagement um, and what they needed to put together for us 
to be able to activate that strategy and to be able to have a really successful sprint, sprint they were very, um, very, very much engaged. So there was no no pulling from that. Um, it does take time. I will, I will, will, will be very, very honest in that. Um, it takes time to you know make sure that the materials are are done in a way that is um, of the uh, utmost professional quality, but also that really engages all different types of learners. So it's really important to have some visual learning in there, as well as auditory learning, as well as reading that people can do at their own time and their own pace, and they can go back and reinforce that. So all different types of learning modalities really are needed. And because of that, it just takes a little bit of time to take all of your materials and put them in a, in a fashion that people will, will um, really want to, to actually look and be excited for the next day that comes for their next little learning sprint. Beautiful. We only have about two or three minutes, so I'm going to try and get them a little rapid fire here. But the, I'm wondering how were the how was how was the leader's role changed? So you said about being like camera shy. I'm wondering um, as they are, are they as you do more and more virtual. So everything you talked about, sort of tighter materials with visuals and reading, it clearly changes the leader's role. So do you see? Have you got any feedback from leaders that 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 they see this as a new way and getting and thinking about a way to prepare their messages and be on camera is powerful and and do they like the feedback so when they're looking at the the dialogue and being part of seeing a bunch of people talking about their strategy or their role are, are you seeing a change in the way leaders think about their role as a result of both a digital world and strategy activation I, I think I'll say it's slow. Um, it, it'll take a while before it's it's fully digestible, um, and that people and it becomes their second nature, right? They're very used to getting up in front of a crowd and 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 giving a PowerPoint presentation, and they've done that you know their whole careers. So it's a different way of working, and it, it, it takes steps. But they get really excited when they hear people talking about um, the programs and about the strategies and. One of the things I did fail to mention is that one of the last pieces of the JJOS exchange is we ask um, the participants to commit to um, this new way of working, this new JJOS way, and to actually put a very personal um, commitment statement down. And I think the leaders really appreciated that because it made it come alive to them too, that some of the folks could actually, in their own words, take what that strategy was and really uh, articulate very clearly how they were going to commit as a, not only a participant in the project or the program that we were running, but as a leader within J and J. Beautiful. All right, I have a final question. This is my uh, either your Wonder Woman, which I think is the number one movie. Did I hear something like that? Um, or you're going to answer this question differently. How many learning and development people support? all of these initiatives. Oh, maybe so you could talk a, about this, expand on the structure, Liz, and then that's it for us. We're going to run out of time. Okay, so real short, um, we have a fairly small team. We depend on partners like CorpU to help us out. So, so right now, my team is made up of nine people, and we have responsibility for um, all of the leadership development programs within the supply chain. I'm not for J&J, but just for the supply chain, um, as well as our uh, learning and development that we do around continuous improvement, so Lean and Six Sigma. And then we have a, um, a large, um, shall I say, um, program currently ongoing with our supervisors in, the, in our plants where we are providing, um, say, softer skills or softer leadership skills. And so we have, uh, we spend a fair amount of time in that in that space also beautiful Liz thank you so much and thank you to our participants for wonderful questions I've got a screen full of questions that we are not going to be able to get to but we have the presentation we have this recorded we'll have the um, the slides sent to people so if you want to replay this back and if you have any questions you can certainly email those to me a Todd at corpu.com a T O D D at corpu.com. I'll make sure I get them to Liz. I'll get them. I'll get you answers, uh, whatever we can do to be helpful. So Liz, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. We greatly appreciate it and your continued partnership. Um, best of luck to you. And thanks again. Have a great rest of your week. Thank you.
Thanks, all.